A murder haunting a quiet Pennsylvania industrial town. I want to get to the bottom of it. I want the answer. 17-year-old high school senior Holly Brannigan discovered in a pool of blood in the kitchen of her upscale home. And the knife was just all the way in her back. The investigation spanning decades. That it was the number one case that I wanted to solve. They made me feel like I did it. 45 years later, investigators say somebody knows something. I believe there are people who know something that um, would help this investigation. About the murder on Pine Top Trail. No place cookie cutter or beautiful should be scarred like this. No parent should be robbed of their child by the kind of violence that was visited upon that family. That shouldn't happen. March 29, 1979. Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, a city run by steel 70 miles north of Philadelphia. I remember walking home from school that afternoon from the bus stop and seeing the police cars and seeing the yellow tape. And I'd never seen anything like that before. Inside 469 Pine Top Trail, detectives were in the infant stages of what was quickly becoming one of the city's most puzzling crime scenes in one of its wealthiest neighborhoods. 17-year-old Holly Brannigan had been mutilated with a butcher knife found in her own home. The medical examiner said she was stabbed 18 times and left to die alone in a pool of blood on her kitchen floor. It was a very violent crime scene. It was a very violent way to die. My name is uh, Thomas Galloway. I uh, am a retired Bethlehem Police Department officer. On March 28, 1979, it was a Wednesday. Holly Brannigan attended high school for the day, and she arrived home. It was about 2.30. Holly was home alone. Her father, Richard, a successful executive with Lone Star Cement, was on his way to a business conference in Atlantic City. Her brother, Sean, was spending the night fixing cars at a friend's house. When she arrived home, she fixed herself a meal. If I recall, I think it was like cereal sat in one of the bedrooms with the phone, was talking on the phone with a girlfriend. That call was interrupted by a knock at the door. Holly answered the door. Holly got back on the extension, which was the phone in the downstairs area, picked it up, told her friend that she had to go. That friend would never hear from Holly again. Investigators believe the only person who would was an employee at Lone Star Cement. Holly made one more phone call about 15 minutes after the knock at the door. Holly called her father's work and talked to the receptionist who answered the phone and asked her if her father had left for his trip yet. The receptionist told her that his, her father had left on this trip, and so Holly hung up the phone. Sean Brannigan would later tell investigators he tried calling his landline several times that night, but got a busy signal. Just before 11 on the morning of the 29th, he returned home with a friend. They immediately notified law enforcement to respond. You can see her from the door. My name is Craig Stefko, and I'm a retired officer in the city of Bethlehem. Officer Stefko had been on the force about two years when he received the radio call. He raced to Pine Top Trail and was one of the first on scene. Even though more than four decades have passed since then, the image is still burned in his memory. She was face down, head turned to the right with a butcher's knife sticking out of her back. The body was actually over here. Stefko describes himself as a diligent note taker and says while investigators examined the crime scene, he took inventory of potential evidence. I did check her bedroom. And the only thing I ever did was I took a pen out and moved a newspaper and found her phone off the hook, which is part of the investigation as to why her brother couldn't get a hold of her. Back in the kitchen, something else caught Stefko's eye. Just feet away from Holly's body, the word violator was spelled out with magnets on the freezer door. 
I, I don't know what significance that had or if that was just there all the time, but I thought that was kind of weird. Investigators quickly realized they were standing in the center of Bethlehem's biggest mystery. Who would want to kill Holly and why? Her teachers at Freedom High School described her as a well-liked student she was involved with the high school orchestra program and other musical activities. She's always been quiet, on the quiet side. Um, I wouldn't call her shy. I'm Sally Siegfried, and Holly Brannigan was my dearest friend. We both were not in the cool crowd. Most everyone that she ran into, I would think, liked her. I mean, I, I never heard of anybody not liking her. The two grew up just a few houses away from each other on Pine Top Trail. They spent much of their younger years together. As they got older and as friend circles changed, their only time alone was during morning rides to Freedom High School. That morning I remember very clearly. I've done very well forgetting a lot of things, but that's not one. I remember getting in the car and going to her house and I pulled up on the one side and came under the carport and I would beep the horn. And usually she was ready, so she was in the car within three, three minutes, three, four minutes. She didn't come and didn't come. Sally says she decided to get out of her car with the intention of knocking on the door. Perhaps Holly overslept, but as she made her way around the side of the house and up the steps to the deck off the kitchen, she says something came over her. When I started to go up the steps to the deck, I thought, this is really improper. This is rude and impolite. Additionally, I did hear my mom say, don't go any further. My mom had died in ninth, when I was in ninth grade, but I always felt her with me. Sally eventually left alone and made the drive to Freedom High School, where she says she dialed the Brannigan's landline several times throughout the morning, only to be met with a busy signal. It wasn't until we had an assembly that day that um, I got pulled out of the assembly and said, we need to see you in the principal's office right now. They said, are you willing to speak to the press? And I said, excuse me? And they said, well, the police are here and the press are here and they want you to make a statement. And I said, about what? And that's when they said, oh, you didn't know Holly Brannigan was murdered? As news of Holly's murder began spreading around town, Sally says she was driven by officers to Bethlehem Police Station, where she felt interrogated by investigators. They made me feel like I did it. They made me feel like I knew something that I wasn't sharing. For whatever reason, I should feel guilty. Sally says she spent a lot of time inside the Brannigan home with Holly over the years and thought police would still find evidence of that now as they searched it. I, and I thought, I'm, I'm really in big trouble because my everything's there. I live there. You, you can find fingerprints of mine anywhere you want to look because I was everywhere. I'm scared kid. Even though she walked out of the police station on her own that day, Sally still felt under the microscope of police. They said that they had to assume that everyone was a suspect. That was as polite as they got to me. I, I still felt like that way for a while. Then she says the phone calls began. I'd pick it up and they'd say, you're dead. And I'm thinking, I don't know who did it. And I didn't do it. So are you saying that because you think I'm the one who did this or because you think I know who did this? While the murder of a 17-year-old high school senior would surely dominate the headlines in 1979, Holly's death wasn't the biggest news story the day after her body was discovered. That's because 70 miles away, just outside Pennsylvania's state capital, Please do not come out. the nation's largest nuclear meltdown was happening at Three Mile Island. Radiation leaked into the air, putting tens of thousands in harm's way. Later in the day, when the official readings were updated, the governor asked that all preschool children and pregnant mothers be evacuated as a precaution. News of the murder eventually faded from the headlines as investigators ran into several roadblocks while working with the little evidence they had 
to find Holly's killer. But it continued to haunt those who called this quiet steel community home. That includes a then 12-year-old boy, Holly Babysat. My name is Eric Dowdle. There was a murderer walking among us in Bethlehem who killed a girl in her kitchen with a butcher knife, like something you'd see in a movie. Speaking of movies, horror flick Halloween came out just months before Holly's death. Holly went, went to see it with her friends and it deeply disturbed her. She talked about how it was disturbing, which at the time, it was a very disturbing movie. It was uh, the first of its kind. It was screening in Bethlehem the week she was murdered. Was there a copycat killer on the loose? At that moment, it was, a, it was deeply disturbing to um, the youth. As fear set in, Holly's father, Richard Brannigan, was grief-stricken. I'm not looking for revenge or anything like that. As I say, I'm looking for resolution so I can forget, uh, not forget it, but bring an end to it and, and get some conclusion as to what went on. And that's really all I, I'm looking for. But six months after Holly's murder, tragedy would strike the Brannigan family once again. I lost my whole family. The murder of 17-year-old Holly Brannigan was a turning point for people who lived in one of Bethlehem's most prestigious neighborhoods. Do I want to be as melodramatic as to say it was a loss of innocence? I don't want to say that because I don't know that it was. But things were different. In the weeks and months that followed, no two people on Pine Top Trail were struggling more than Richard Brannigan and his son, Sean. Sean did tell me one time, he said, Dad, he says, I'm going to get the word out that I know who did it. I said, don't you dare. It's unclear if Sean ever followed through on that. He may not have had time to. On September 9, 1979, nearly six months after Holly's murder, tragedy hit the Brannigan family once again. While Sean and his friend were cleaning the floors with a steam generator at Renner's Mobile gas station, the machinery exploded, critically burning him. He died from his injuries a few days later, which meant Richard was now alone. I lost my whole family. The rumors began almost immediately. Did Sean have something to do with Holly's murder? Was he dead because he knew the identity of his sister's killer? During the initial investigation, Sean Brannigan was interviewed and ruled out as a suspect. There was no connection between Sean's death and Holly's death, as far as the investigation can reveal. For months after Holly's murder, Bethlehem detectives searched for clues. They interviewed her friends uh, over and over again with the hopes that uh, possibly they would have information of her life that would, that would reveal something that would connect her to the person who did this. At one point, they took an unorthodox route. They hired a mentalist who was well known in local media. He had hypnotized uh, one of her friends for the purpose of seeing if she could uh, recall better information um, subconsciously than what she, she could provide uh, from her memory. They um, conducted polygraph examinations on a number of people. None of their efforts cracked the case. They were still actively investigating it into the early 1980s. At, at some point, the investigation does go cold. The investigation took a back seat for Bethlehem police for the rest of the 80s, 90s, and into the 2000s. They follow up on information as they receive it, but investigating it, I guess, is one of those things that just kind of slows down. Then, in 2008, almost 30 years after Holly was murdered, the investigation landed on Bethlehem detective Tom Galloway's desk. He spent the next six to eight months sorting through it, familiarizing himself with the case file. The person who knocked on the door has never been identified by police. And that would have been a point that the police were very interested in. It's a point that when we were conducting our, our current investigation, we were you know, very curious about as well. When Holly was murdered in 1979, DNA testing didn't exist. Instead, investigators relied on other methods of collecting evidence. And they did take a number of fingerprints. So fingerprint evidence was collected. Clothing was kept collected. Blood was collected. And her body was examined by the coroner. 
The pathologist ruled out that Holly was sexually assaulted. He found defensive wounds on her hands and arms and evidence of a struggle when her attacker prevented her from escaping through the sliding glass door. The attack appears to be personal. The attack was very vicious, but um, doesn't necessarily mean that that person who arrived at that time intended to kill her. I'm Judge John Morganelli. Uh, I'm the former district attorney for Northampton County, a position that I held for 28 years. In February 2010, then District Attorney Morganelli impaneled a grand jury to look at about 30 unsolved homicides that dated back nearly as many years. I labeled the Holly Brannigan case as my number one case, that it was the number one case that I wanted to solve uh, for the Brannigan family, also for the community. The grand jury met once a week for the better half of a year and heard testimony from anyone Morganelli and detectives he assigned to the case thought might be helpful to the investigation. We had uh, police investigators who were at the crime scene the night it happened. We interviewed just about all of Holly Brannigan's friends and associates that were available. We brought people in from out of state uh, who had moved out of the area, who were friends of Holly. And I was able to cross-examine all these witnesses to test their credibility, to test their memory, and to try to see whether we could eliminate some folks that maybe certain police officers thought were good suspects and also create a profile of who we might believe actually committed this murder. Holly's longtime friend Sally Siegfried also testified before the grand jury. She says she was repeatedly questioned about her own whereabouts the night of Holly's murder. They must have asked me that same question three or four times, three or four different ways, as if they still were trying to find out and they said and you stopped at her house on the way home and I, I don't recall doing that I don't believe I would have again it's too late at night on a school night why would I do that's something her parents and my parents would never go for but they kept asking the same things over and over I don't feel like I got 10 questions I feel like I got four that were asked in different phrasings even though Morganelli was laser-focused on finding Holly's killer, he also needed to discredit rumors that would distract him from finding the truth about what happened to Holly. Because there was lots of theories. It was her girlfriend who came over. It was a friend of hers from school. There was rumors that Holly was pregnant, which turned out not to be the case based on the autopsy. And what about the murder weapon? the butcher knife the murderer used to stab Holly 18 times. We were really trying to see if we could get, extract some DNA from the knife, and when we sent the, the knife back down to uh, the FBI lab in, I think it was Virginia, but we were unable to do that. There was some disagreement as to whether or not we agreed on who perhaps perpetrated this murder. There were one or two investigators in the city of Bethlehem Police who believed that a certain person was the person who committed the murder. I was not convinced because I didn't really see the evidence that I could say uh, assuredly that's the person and we have enough to charge and convict. Despite some law enforcement members having a theory as to who killed Holly, Morgan Alley ultimately decided not to bring charges against anyone. And in the end, there was no one that I think that we could have credibly charged with this offense. And although we were able to eliminate some folks, we were never able to really say with uh, conviction that this is the person that uh, I'm strongly convinced did this crime and we have evidence to prove it. Do you believe the grand jury interviewed Holly's killer? In 2010, 31 years after Holly Brannigan was murdered in her home on Pine Top Trail, then Northampton County District Attorney John Morganelli paneled a grand jury with the hopes of finding her murderer. There were some uh, officers who felt that they knew who did this. They couldn't maybe prove it, but they had a strong feeling. And that's just not enough for us in the criminal law. We have to have evidence to present to a jury uh, to convict someone. After several months of testimony and few theories about who stabbed Holly 18 times, the veteran prosecutor decided there was not enough evidence to bring charges against anyone. Do you believe the grand jury interviewed Holly's killer? Uh, I do. I would agree with him wholeheartedly. 
I mean, you have to look at it this way. Was this a random event? Was it just someone who happened to be wandering through Northeast Bethlehem and stop at Holly Brannigan's home? I don't believe that's the case. The case again quieted down after the grand jury. Then in March 2014, a newspaper headline seemed to show promising news. It read, Suspect Emerges in Brannigan Case. That article was an anniversary article. Did authorities finally have a break in the case? Were they, after 35 years, releasing a suspect's name? The short answer is no. After reading the article, there was no suspect named. When that article was published with uh, the claim that, that we had a suspect, there was someone that uh, was very much a, a person of interest and a suspect. And there was a body of circumstantial evidence that said that person had committed the crime. Obviously, we weren't able to bring the burden of proof up to probable cause. No one has been charged in the 45 years since Holly's murder. Neither the DA or detective would name who they think killed Holly. And after decades of police work, Detective Galloway retired in February 2024. I investigated the case from 2008 to 2016, and I would say that on February 12th of 2016, our case went cold. Galloway won't elaborate on the significance of that date and why he believes it's connected to the case. Today, the identity of Holly's killer remains a mystery to most. I still believe that there are people that we interviewed who did, did not tell us everything they knew. And I do believe that there are some questions that were asked that people were either reluctant to answer or um, maybe didn't give us the complete answer and possibly gave us a false answer. There are, however, theories that investigators have been able to eliminate over the years, such as the origin of the word violator Officer Stefko found spelled out with magnets on the Brannigan's freezer door. Sean's best friend was Viola. They used to play with the magnets uh, to make fun of each other. Violator was a, a reference to Viola that either Sean or, or his friend Viola put up there. Somebody had to know something. Richard Brannigan would spend 37 years searching for answers until his death on March 17, 2016, at the age of 97. When I go, I go, and that's it. Maybe when I go, I'll find out the answer upstairs. Sally Siegfried went on to marry her high school sweetheart and build a family. I would like to believe that the killer would be caught. I, my logical side says no. If we've gone 45 years without no one. And after 28 years as district attorney, John Morganelli was sworn in as a judge of the Court of Common Pleas in January 2020. I wish I could have solved this case in my career as DA. It would have been one of my better uh, achievements. And while he hopes Bethlehem police and the new district attorney are successful in achieving something he was unable to accomplish, he's skeptical the community won't ever see justice regarding the murder on Pine Top Trail. I'm not uh, closing the, the door to it. I think it'll be difficult. There is a contingent of internet sleuths trying to crack the case on their own. It doesn't seem like they have gotten any closer to solving it than the police. Everyone we spoke with says it might take one person to remember something they saw more than four decades ago. I need the closure. I need to know who did it. I need to know why they did it. And then I need to pray for a very long time so that I can possibly get over this. People have to cooperate. I mean, you're keeping this alive, which is great. And, and, and I'm thankful that I'm part of this. But I think if more people know, this is, there's gotta be, there could be somebody out there that, that is, realizes this is being looked into you again. And they might have something or say something. The public outcry in Bethlehem to find Holly's killer has faded through the years. The story is revisited mostly on anniversaries of the crime, bringing up memories for those who knew the 17-year-old. They've never had justice, so the analogy of picking a scab is true. It, it's painful. They experienced something that is uh, that I don't think we can understand unless we've also experienced it. On some level, 
this girl is laying in a grave and it bothers us at a very core level that a pretty young girl like that was snuffed out. Just like that. The Bethlehem Police Department declined to participate in this project, citing Galloway's recent retirement. The department says the Brannigan case is important and it plans on assigning it a new detective. If you have any information about the murder of Holly Brannigan, contact the Bethlehem Police Department at 610-691-6660.